<laughs> there are some really easy ways to get an argument started. And I know two of them for sure. One, is it wrong for a Christian to buy just one lottery ticket? I mean, out of all the lifetime of earnings and out of all that even one of God's faithful believers might spend for leisure and entertainment, would it be wrong to spend one dollar, an amount you might well earn in a few minutes of work, on a lotto ticket? Question number two, is it wrong for a Christian to go into a movie theater one time to see one Walt Disney film or one of the new Christian movies. Now, as some of you politically minded listeners might know, Disney films lately have a whole new reputation and none of us, I hope, would think of leaving our money at the turnstile. But that's the question. One old yeller type Disney film one time or the Christian movie God isn't dead? Well, here's why I'm posing both questions. A few years ago, back at our radio broadcast, we received a little 60 page booklet from Moody Press entitled Tony Evans Speaks Out on Gambling and the Lottery. Well, Evans from the Oak Cliff Bible Fellowship in Dallas, Texas, makes an interesting point. God has given you and me a testimony. So even when it comes to things that we clearly think are okay to do, we must ask if these things are going to hinder our ability to be a witness. Will they hinder anybody else from taking us seriously as Christians? Well, now how does that connect up with a Christian Disney film? Well, he goes on and I'm quoting now, there are some places I go to minister where it would be illegitimate for me to go to a movie. And I'm talking about Walt Disney movie. In that part of the country, Christians don't go to movies. It is an offense to the non-Christian to see a Christian go to the movies. Well, interestingly, Evans immediately takes the discussion back to the very Bible writer we're studying here in this book of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul. What would Paul do in such dilemmas, he asks. He wouldn't flaunt his freedom. He would avoid the theater because he had a bigger purpose in mind. He didn't want to do anything that hindered him from being a witness. Well, a passage here in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 applies to this very kind of situation. Recall again, please, the letter's background. Paul was writing to a brand new Christian church, a congregation struggling to survive in a pleasure-seeking, night-clubbing city. People were going to have fun. They were having fun. They were into fun in Corinth. They were buying lotto tickets at every 7-Eleven and lining up around the block to see the latest movie, film. The fledgling little Christian church had both mature Christians and brand new, fragile, easily swept off their feet, baby Christians who could lose their way at the tiniest provocation. In verse 12, Paul makes an interesting statement about himself and his own spiritual condition. Everything is permissible for me, he writes. Clearly, Paul wasn't talking about everything. Obviously, the grievous sins he just ran through three verses earlier, adultery, theft, greed, drunkenness, slander, weren't permissible for even the Apostle Paul. No, he was talking about things, things that are not wrong in and of themselves. One Bible commentary sheds this light on the King James expression, all things. The Christian is at liberty to participate in everything that comes within the plan of life formed by God as that which is most beneficial for mankind. Well, the same insightful book emphasizes that God never contradicts himself. He doesn't say in his word, sexual immorality is wrong, and then turn to Paul and whisper, but not for you. So the everything in everything is permissible 
has to fall within the generous parameters of this understanding. What are we saying here? Well, let me suggest that Paul had a crystal clear understanding of the gospel message. After all, the Holy Spirit had revealed much of it through him. Paul would know all about freedom in Christ and the concept of being set at liberty from the condemnation of the law. So it's extremely helpful to read exactly how he limits his own freedom. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. And then he goes on to give us an example of what he means. In fact, he repeats the same line. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Something that might be perfectly harmless in itself, he notes, could easily jump up, wrap itself around you a thousand times, and soon you'd be mastered by that supposedly good, permissible thing. The September 2, 1996 Newsweek edition reports that one in seven Louisiana young people ages 18 to 21 are compulsive gamblers now triple the rate of adults. Why is it happening? Sociologists think it's an easy jump from video games to video poker. All too easy a leap, says Louisiana to Senator Jay Darden, who joins others in worrying about the problem. We might reasonably observe that a video game is no big deal just a quarter spent, or maybe even not that much, if you play on your own laptop computer. But that one permissible little treat might grow to become your master. Even if you're a rock-solid, Bible-believing Christian. I like how Jack Blanco expresses Paul's determination at that end of the verse in the clear word. I will not be mastered by anything except the love of Jesus Christ. But now listen. Our even more important application, which weaves its way all through the New Testament writings of Paul, this zealous leader who knew infant Christians were watching him, wouldn't even do some of the things he knew in his heart were all right for him if he thought it would cause someone else to stumble. That's the most noble interpretation of the expression, not everything is beneficial, not beneficial to the Christian church he loved so much. Now we find this principle enunciated more clearly in chapter eight and again in chapter 10. So we will wait until then to discuss the topic further. You can peek ahead and see that our study of 1 Corinthians 8 is entitled, Your Necklace Offends Me. Take it off. To what extent do we take off a necklace or not see that Disney film? Even throw away that favorite necktie that some conservative little saint thinks has too much red in it. Somebody's always mad about something, aren't they? Do we let the Puritan sisters run our lives? Those are questions we will get into as we encounter them. But for now, let's simply say that Paul loved these people. He loved the church, the frail body of Christ. And linking back with the earlier passage in which he counsels us to not sue each other not insist on our own rights, he opens up his own heart. I won't do it either, he tells us. I'll give up things that for me would be absolutely not a sin because of my fellow believers out of concern for them. I'll get by without the one minute buzz of buying a lottery ticket. In Matthew 22, Jesus gave us the two great commandments. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. 
This is the first and greatest commandment. Verse 37 to 39 says, and the second is like it. Lonnie, love your neighbor as yourself. This Pauline section of God's word, 1 Corinthians, may seem so Spartan to us, sacrificing yourself for others, giving up your rights. No lottery tickets, no suing your neighbor, even if you could beat him and he's wrong. Perhaps you feel that we've journeyed together through a rather gloomy patch here. But as I read through all that Paul had to say, I don't find gloom. Mm -mm. Even when he was in prison for his faith, even when he faced the executioner's blade in AD 68, we don't find a life stripped of joy. On the contrary, every single book, every single letter that he writes fairly glows with rich, intense happiness. He bubbles over with radiant joy. The Christian faith, even with 1 Corinthians 6 thrown in, which Paul clearly turned around and applied to himself, was a source of blessedness to the admittedly shallow, incomplete extent that any of us today have experienced that same kind of sacrificial joy, we can say along with Paul at the end of this letter in chapter 1558, Lonnie, your labor in the Lord is not in vain.